Hello, I'm Zash, and welcome to episode 36 of my G Senjo no Mao, or the Devil on G String. Let's read. Joining me, as always, is my co reader, Faith. As you might detect, I'm just getting over a cold when I'm recording this, so my voice is a bit off. Just so you know, I'm not changing the voices, I'm just getting over a cold and I sound strange. Anyway, last episode, we learned a bit more about Kyosuke's hard past and we reached a breakthrough. We found Saijo's hiding place, but he had already abandoned it. However, Usami found a clue to where he went. Anyways, please enjoy. Usami clenched the note in her hands and stood up. If he didn't get the package, then that means Saijo might come back for it. That's highly improbable. After all, he knows he's being chased by the Yakuza. So, you mean... Yes. The package will have been rerouted to Saijo's current hiding place. Usami took out her phone and dialed the number on the ticket. Uh, hello. Sure, the package number? Yes, yes. 265. I'll hold. It looks like she's been forwarded to speak with the driver directly. Hi, could you please try to deliver that last package one more time? Uh, I'm Sajo's younger sister. Yep. Oh, and where did Nissan ask you to deliver the package to? The dummy managed to forget it himself somehow. Yep. The Central District's Plaza Hotel, great. Thank you very much. No, no, that's the place he wants you to deliver to, it's all good. The call ended. The Plaza Hotel? Yeah. Do you know it? I do. I'll send some people over there right now. Please do. And make sure every last exit is airtight. We can't let him get away this time. Alright, I'll give Gonzo the scoop and ask for more men. After sending Horiba and the rest on a wild goose chase, I'll have to personally apologize anyway. I understand. See you there. Saw me handsomely dashed out into the night road. Well then, I suppose I've got things to do too. Megalipses. Ellipses. Ellipses. Megalipses. It's not like there are any variables whatsoever. Naturally, my plan is perfect. But the choice of executor may present some problems. The phone in my chest pocket begins vibrating. It was my loyal prince of hell, Mephistopheles. Saijo. Did you delete the email I sent you? Yeah, I completely erased it from my computer. However, if the police become involved, they may be able to recover deleted data. I'll just remove the computer entirely from the room later. What do you think of the hotel? I hope you're satisfied with their accommodations. Saijo seems to be very upset. Don't take this the wrong way. I'm not questioning your power, Mao. But is this really okay? Whatever do you mean? Those Yakuza are unnaturally sharp. They probably found my apartment already. That's correct. But didn't you foresee this and lay traps? Sure. But, will those thugs even notice? If they can't even solve a problem on that level, then there's no need to worry about them. It's reassuring to hear you say that. You're right. I'm sorry. It's still too early to relax. There will be no problems, I promise you. As long as you don't make any stupid mistakes, that is. Then, about the next plan... Right. I didn't finish last time. Megalipses. Ellipses. Haru stood silently on the sidewalk outside of the hotel, staring at the entrance, completely still. 
Kyosuke had called moments ago. Kyosuke had to accompany Gonzo, so he couldn't come to the hotel personally. However, he sent every nearby member of the Sonia group to her aid. The young men sitting on the guardrail looked like they were playing on their cell phones. But each and every one of them was actually watching the hotel's entrance. After 10 o'clock, the sea of people thinned out, and almost 20 devilish-looking men appeared. After a few words of greeting, they immediately began preparations for raiding the room. The underground parking lot, the four exits of the hotel, and the fire exits were all covered. All possible escape routes had been sealed. Perhaps the men simply had incredible discipline, as they all set out to do their respective duties without a word of complaint. Someone had already gone and disguised as a would-be guest and got Sajo's room number from the front desk. The only thing left to do was charge in. Haru's thoughts raced as she walked along the hotel's marble hall. Silence reigned over everything. Perhaps it was simply excellent insulation, but not a speck of sound escaped from the numerous doors. Why did Mao choose to work with Saijo? With an accomplice, a criminal can achieve much more, for sure. However, at the same time, more issues also arise. Often, a brilliant plan by a brilliant criminal is ruined by a stupid henchman. Things just didn't add up. Naturally, Mao had thought this out. He would have properly planned ahead of time. Even if Saijo did get captured, he would still make his escape. Nevertheless, bits and pieces of his plan would be pried from his accomplice's mouth. So why? Right here. Man escorting her murmured. He was a portly man. A golden chain gently dangled around his fat neck. Before her knew, she was already in front of the room the Saijo had deserved. Words softly floated from her mouth. Can you knock for me? I'll stand in front of the people. Saja already knows what Haru looks like. Even so, her image would be less apt to cause a panic than that of a Yakuza thug. She took out a white scarf from her skirt pocket and applied a bit of makeup. If she brings her face really close to the door, then the person inside won't see her clothes. Her fat entourage stood in front of the door and made a light fist. He knocked. Ellipses. Megalipses. Hmm? What's going on? My grip tightened on the phone I was speaking to Saijo with. Someone's knocking. At this hour? Yeah, it's probably room service. Be careful. Take a good look at them through the peephole first. Saijo's breathing dominated the phone signal for a few moments. It's a woman. A young woman. A woman? She's got a white hat, maybe? I can't really see her clothes. Surely it isn't. Do you recognize her? We saw Usami once at the harbor. I... I don't think so. A vague answer. I remember Usami's outrageous hair. Perhaps that was all within her calculations. But without that hair, the girl would look radically different. Maybe it's a delivery of some kind? Don't count on it. I spoke flatly. I've never known a delivery person to bring something at midnight. Perhaps sensing my caution, Saijo also lowered his voice. What should I do? Does she have any intentions of leaving? No. She keeps looking this way. She's barely even moving. If that's Usami, then why? A shiver crawled over my body. How could she possibly have discovered this hotel? I have something to ask you. This may be the last time I speak to Saijo. Did you clear out all the garbage in the room? Of course. I cleaned the place out and took all the garbage to the dumpster. Ellipses. Then, answer her. Open the door. Are you sure? Yes. Very well. I'll hang up for now. Right. There's no other way. If they've chased him this far, there's nowhere to run. Those Yakuza, the Soa Alliance, will have already sealed off all the exits. Not even a drop of water can escape their barricades. Locking himself in would only buy time.
the knocking continued. But after five minutes, ten minutes, there was still no answer. She couldn't even feel the presence of a living person in there. Though she'd begun to waver, Haru contacted the front desk. She suggested that the man inside might have collapsed. The management informed her shortly thereafter that no one was answering the phone either. After telling them of her intentions to check inside the room, a building manager finally came to meet her with a set of keys. The door swung open. Why? Her bitter lip part as crushing defeat gnawed at her heart. My terrible assumptions were unfounded. The phone rang once more. It wasn't anything to worry about, Mao. Huh. Saijo wouldn't call so quickly after being apprehended. I can safely posit that he's safe. The girl at the front desk noticed that I had dropped my passport and brought it up to me. That's probably because you packed your things in such a hurry. Nonetheless, it's good that nothing happened. Had me freaked out for a minute, though. I was wondering how the hell I... they could know I was in this budget hotel. Your pursuers should be dashing to the Central District's Plaza Hotel right about now. I was just worrying too much. In other words, I had overestimated Usami. Usami could only go as far as the Plaza Hotel. She couldn't possibly have predicted that Saijo might be in this cheap hotel in the Eastern District. You had me make a mistake on purpose, Mao. Yes. Ever since the incident at the arena, they had begun to underestimate you. I probably couldn't have fled this well without your help, Mao. It's amazing that you came up with this so quickly. You were the one who told me your luggage was set to be delivered this afternoon, correct? That was a great help. The delivery notice was left as bait. The delivery man was sent to the wrong hotel on purpose. To a hotel where Saijo checked in, but never stayed. Instead, Saijo went to the Plaza Hotel and entered his room once, and then he left immediately and went to the Eastern District. This time, I made sure to follow your directions to a T. I browsed websites hinting at Hakata, I didn't delete search engines history, and I left the browser open on the entertainer's blog. Don't forget the cab at 4.30. That way, even Yakuza could infer that you were going to Hakata. But the truth is that I never got out of the cab. But the truth is that I got out of the cab quickly. I went back to the apartment and took care of the note at the same time. It was a bit of a dramatic masterpiece. A play that suggests he had left despite staying right where he was. Then I threw the note out with the garbage, so that anyone searching for a mistake of mine would dig it up and contact the post office. Usami's limit was right there, created a ruse within a ruse. You left her all the clues. All we really gauged was how Usami would interpret them. In the end, the children found an answer, and, intoxicated with happiness, stopped searching for the truth. The Yakuza heading for Hakata. Usami headed for the hotel. They're all the same. It was a brilliant plan, Mao. Oh, please. That wasn't modesty. Do you know of Zhu Liang's empty fort strategy? At first glance, it's a brilliant tactic with a ruse within a ruse. But it's actually nothing more than a pathetic getaway scheme. In the end... The fact that Saijo is being chased by the Soa Alliance hadn't changed. It doesn't really matter whether or not the battle is won. Well then, let's continue. Right, you were talking about that girl who saw me. I mustered all the coldness I could. Let's kill her. Megalipses. Ellipses. For crying out loud, every last one of you assholes is useless. I'm very sorry. Yeah, we're real sorry. Iichi put on airs of importance the next afternoon. Just when did you plan on introducing me to a girl, Usami-san? Huh? Now you've seen what I'm really like, I'm quite the prick, ain't I? 
I'm at the age where I just want to penetrate something. I can't wait anymore. It's only been two days, and he's already impatient as hell. All right, tell you what, I'll help you find your dream girl. Just please calm down for now. This Joker's mood is just a disaster today. What's got you all riled up this time? I actually ate dinner with my dad yesterday. It's been a long time, okay? You have a dad? What? Didn't you grow up in an orphanage? That was all a lie. My dad's a hotelier. Seriously? The Central District's Plaza Hotel, Grand Hotel, and Top of Tumbent Betsu are all under dad's control. You're shitting me. If you think I'm lying, then how about I give you a free night? It sounds dirty, H. -E. Ellipses. Ellipses. I glanced at Usami. Seems legit. <clears throat> I didn't know at all. I have heard of a hotel owner named Aizawa before, but who would have ever believed that he was actually Iichi's father? Wait a second. So for all that calling me rich and pampered, you grew up in a wealthy household too? I'm different from you. Dad's really strict about everything. He even told me I couldn't keep insects as pets. Isn't that just nuts? I see. Plus, Dad got home at two last night. What do you think he was doing? And as soon as he shows up, he starts talking about his job. Was it about the Plaza Hotel? Yeah, they say a guest disappeared. He registered and all, but the phone number he gave didn't work, and the address was a phony. They wanted to call the police, but then they found the room key and the payment under the bed. You didn't call the police, did you? There was nothing stolen or anything after all. They didn't, but who? Dad would have done more than bitch about it if they had. He kept on saying, if a word about something like this came out, then our reputation would be ruined and customers wouldn't come anymore. I'm the owner of the place, so they should stop crying to me each and every time some piddly crap like this comes up. I mean, tell me about it, right? I'm just your son, so stop crying to me about this crap. What are you trying to do? Make me turn to delinquency here? Oh, come on. Your father's a good person. You should take a lesson from him. <laughs> you mere mortals can't possibly understand my worries. Yichi just keeps on sulking. Nothing would stop him now. So, that means we were completely played. Not for all the trouble we've been through. After class was over, Usami and I held a strategy meeting. About that Saijo. Yeah? I asked Gonzo about this so-called Great Japan Revolutionary School. He said he'd never heard of it. Is it because it's small enough to fly under the radar? Who knows? Those organizations are a dime a dozen. Then it'll be difficult to track Saijo through that route. Have you tried Google? Yeah. In the meantime, Horibe and his crew are combing through the inner city's hotels. And not just hotels, but subway stations, under bridges, and any other places a person might be staying. They're even checking vacant office buildings. But couldn't Saijo have escaped to another prefecture by now? Yeah, I hear you. The creep's probably scared to death of the power of the Sowa Alliance by now. Seeing as how that might be the case, Gonzo issued orders last night and sent over a hundred people out of the prefecture to cooperate with the local gangs and collect information about Mao and Saijo. When you tack on the upcoming battle with the Shin'e group, the Sonoyama group has its hands full. If there's anything I can do... Isn't waiting for news the only thing to do? To be more precise, since we failed last time, we can't make rash movements anymore. Let's go back to the drawing board. Hmm? Cannon was awarded the NHK trophy. Because it's one against Mao's orders, her mother, Ikuka-san, is in mortal danger. That's why we're searching for Saijo in the first place. That's true. She's being kind of vague about this. Saijo's a chess piece Mao prepared for this match. The use of an accomplice represents a potential risk but also a corresponding return to go along with that risk. Thus, the method he'll use to take Iku's life is one that relies on the existence of said accomplice, correct? 
We have to work under that assumption. If Mao could do it himself all along, there'd be no need to recruit someone else. Therefore, Saijo must be within the city. Isn't that right? Yeah. I suppose chasing Saijo is still the best course of action. If we catch Saijo, it's possible that we can disrupt Mal's plans. I sneered. What's wrong? Getting depressed already? No way, that could never happen. The only times I've ever gotten depressed were when I lost my wallet and when I found out that penguins made it. This girl's got a screw loose. I want to go back to Sajo's apartment one more time and look for clues. Alright, don't do anything rash. Understood. I am one of the victim candidates after all. After her statement, we saw me prepared to head home. Megalipses. Ellipses. The happy sound of children's laughter weaved into the surroundings. Mephistopheles, Saijo, was sitting on a bench in the Eastern District's park, waiting for Mao to contact him. The elementary school students, ignoring the brisk wind, fought to get to the sandbox and the slide. Saijo thought of his own sister, and of the detective who was in charge of the investigation. Saijo had choked her to death. That sister, who had just started school, whom he loved so much. That smiling, angelic face, which, unbeknownst to him, suddenly had eyeballs bugging out of their sockets. You killed her. No, that's right. She didn't die. His sister loved him. They would hold hands and go to school together. When bathing, she'd scrub him from top to bottom. She never forgot to give him a good night's kiss. In other words, she must have loved him deeply. What was wrong with what he did? Flowers are meant to be picked when they're the most beautiful. Saijo hadn't killed her. He just made her his. It's just that those annoying police exaggerated the matter and forced punishment upon him. He spent those long, hard years, the years before he became a legal adult, in that building with the high fences. Mao's call came. Are you all right? They won't chase me to a faraway park like this. Please, don't underestimate those people. I won't, but until the last three people are killed, I won't leave this city. Yoshida Kimiko, the woman he had failed to kill earlier. Kenasaki Ikuko, the figure skating coach. And the girl named Usami Haru. His heart was aquiver with anticipation for the murderous plans that would be presented to him in the future. I'm at the arena now. One could almost hear the ecstasy drip from Mao's words. The finals will commence tomorrow. It's a large-scale competition, with contestants from six different countries, and represents the closing act of the Grand Prix. The event will be quite extravagant, I suspect. Saijo wanted to ask, Just what the hell are you talking about? However, not wanting to risk hindering their relationship, he stopped himself. Of course. All it really boils down to is a competition about money. It's just a show run by the International Skating Union to help fill their pockets. It's even become common practice for the last season's world champions to abstain from the competition out of fear of losing their popularity and honor. Saijo could only mumble some vague confirmations in response. Even the new evaluation methods are making the sport more boring. Now I must admit, the new scoring system has achieved its intended effects of preventing cheating. But it's just slaughtered the new routines. Under the new rules, the number of jumps is the deciding factor for score. The graceful transitions, one after another, are now unnecessary. Anyone can see the results of the change. Pretty much each and every contestant goes out and does the same program, and since they fear the judges' penalties, they're avoiding any big challenges. 
you can't even see any spectacular falls anymore. Just how is this a free skate? Unbelievably, Mao sighed. This made Saijo a bit insecure. For instance, I think that Setamakiko is better than Azai Cannon. The basis behind this, though, is her set of fundamentals. Her movements, perfectly synchronized with the musical accompaniment, are very beautiful. And I happen to know she overcame many hardships and gave an unrivaled amount of effort. Yet, a single jump with a large amount of rotations is enough to completely upset the rankings. In the end, the victory goes to those who have the flashiest trump card. What a terrible age we've entered. Saijo finally understood his comrades' grievances. Thinking about things clearly, each target up until now has had something to do with figure skating. Ah, I'm sorry. I got a little carried away. Mal, let me ask you something. His suspicion slipped out of his mouth. Aren't you part of the revolution? Aren't you worried about our country? Ellipses. Why do you have such a focus on figure skating? The mysteries just kept piling up. The targets were scum. But still, only normal civilians. Why didn't the names of greater evil, such as government leaders and the masterminds behind religious organizations, appear on the list? As he pondered this point, he let up a bit. I'm sorry for bringing this up now. Maybe it's just something that only someone as sharp as you could understand. Saijo didn't want to be hated by the only person to understand him in decades. And Mao had helped him get out of trouble just yesterday. No. Mao answered with an air of apology. You're spot on. What do you mean? I merely took issue with the current state of figure skating. I wanted to wipe the people who were only in it for the money off the face of the earth. Ellipses. And because of that, I used you. Mao spoke bitterly. Incredibly, flames of anger didn't roar within Saijo's chest. The emotions of an event long forgotten floated to his heart once again. He remembered a time when his sister broke a toy that he treasured. He remembered his sister coming to him with an honest apology. Thank you for your help up until now. Saijo's hand trembled, shaking the phone it held. At the moment, it would appear the best plan is to escape western Japan. Though you could take a bullet train, taking a night bus or ferry would be safer. Please contact me after you get to Fukuoka. I'll prepare a boat for you to take to Taiwan. Just tell me your account number, and the money for the escape will be wired. Wait, Mao. Words burst from his mouth. I never said I wanted to escape. But... No, I'm going to finish this. But why... Saijo made his decision and sighed. I have also been deceiving you. The Great Japan Revolutionary School doesn't exist. No, you could say it exists, but the representatives, public relations department, operations planning, the whole group is one person. Me. What? This world thought of me as a deviant, but you supported me and sent me that powerful emotional message. You called a powerless person such as me a hero. There would be no more hesitation. No matter what Mao's true goal was, he would still be Saijo's friend. Tell me, the person you really want to kill isn't among those three, is it? Your real target is... Saijo said a name. Mao gave a short answer. Yes. I'll help you. Come. Give me instructions. He didn't know when, but the sounds of children playing in the park had completely disappeared. Megalipses. Ellipses. Hiya. Really? Your common courtesy's out the window already? After dinner, Usami suddenly popped in. Your place is so warm, man. Don't curl up on the sofa. Get up! Usami rolled around on my couch, in her uniform. After a while, she stood up. 
At any rate, it sure is hard to get information about a social recluse. Any leads? Usami shook her head wryly. I found a phone bill. Upon examination, it looks like he pays about the same as me, almost nothing. That means, like you, he has no friends. It looks like he only works at places that pay by the day, seeing as how he has his own safety helmets and military gloves. He also seems to be registered at an employment agency. There were a few pay stubs. So he lived a life without a steady job. He actually seems to be rather earnest. I didn't even find a sex service membership or any horse racing tickets. There are signs that he cooked for himself. We even found a clothes iron and pants press. I guess that just goes to show you that sometimes it's the people like that who can be the most dangerous. There was only one thing that we called a lead. Just then, a sound rang out from the front door. Oh god, no. I'm back. I had given Cannon a spare key to the room. Hiya. Hiya. What is wrong with these two? Hey, Usman, you're here. Place is a bit dirty, but go ahead and sit wherever you like. Hey, this is my place! Oh, as rare as it is that we get to have a get-together like this, I have to go home now. Oh? Hey, she just said something about a lead. Why? Let's hang out. For some reason, Usami kept glancing at my bed. Bye. In her hurry with her back slumped, she left. Hey, hey, why did Usman come over? Who knows? To get out of the cold, maybe? Now that you mention it, isn't she freeing her butt off in those clothes? You're wearing booty shorts! A reasonable question, Cannon. Probably. Let's just chalk it up to her strange nature. Hmm? What are you looking at? Why is her face so close to mine? I could see myself reflected in her eyes. You two have a secret, don't you? What? Yes, and it's a secret. Which you don't need to know. The sofa's messy. What did you do? We didn't do anything, okay? Wait, that's... There was a cell phone on the sofa. I think it's Usami's. It must have fallen out when she was rolling around. She even rolled around? By herself, yes. Oh well. I'll give it to her at school tomorrow. Mmm, she's definitely up to something. I haven't seen Papa lately either. Something must be going on around Nanchan. Yeah, that's totally it. Papa's just busy with his end of year responsibilities. And what about all the people who are hanging around Coach? They look like they were sent there by Papa. People are up to something, I tell ya. Hmm, is that so? I knew she'd notice. It's like Coach is being protected, you know? They're even there when she goes to the bathroom. I don't think a lie would work here. Why are they protecting Coach? If it was Mr. Hilton or some important person from the skating union, then I'd understand. What do you think, Nissan? I don't know. Stop talking and go take your bath. What, even Nissan's in on it? You can't stare at Anchan. Don't worry about it. Didn't you say you had no interest in anything besides skating? Oh yeah. Sometimes you say some pretty good things, Nisa. Her smile was immediately restored. The finals start tomorrow, right? Yeah. The lease starts a couple days later, though. Alright, then hurry up and take a bath. Can do. She skipped over to the changing room. Ellipses. If she wasn't able to change moods that quickly, there's a chance she wouldn't be as famous as she is now. Just a single performance from her can have a major influence on a number of people. Whether or not a jump is successful will change the number of spectators and the mood of the sponsors. And this time, her performance is even related to a death threat. If she worried about every little thing, she wouldn't be able to do what she does. Of course, her continuous practice has taken away a normal school life, and there's no such thing as a person who ignores everything else and just lives to skate. Because humans aren't machines. Behind Cannon's casual smiles lies a mountain of bottled up emotions. If she found out that her mother's life was in danger, Megalipses, 
ellipses. Haru wandered through the residential district. There was no wind. The air was dry. It was only moments past noon, and from time to time she spotted mothers who had just finished preparing lunch. After turning around at the same corner for the third time, Haru concluded that she wasn't cut out for stakeouts after all. Carrying a convenience store bag just wasn't enough to disguise her as a normal pedestrian. Wearing a uniform in a peaceful residential area during school hours already made her an attention grabber. Forget about her hair. The target of her stakeout was the hospital she had now walked past numerous times. Its grand entrance bore the sign, Internal Medicine and Neurology. The idea behind the observation came from the hospital issue medication bag she had found the night before in a trash heap near Saijo's house. Inside the torn package was a slip of paper with the medicine's warnings and directions. This told Haru that Sanjo had some neurological disease. After finding three baggies in the same garbage bag, she inferred that he visits the hospital quite often. So cold. The chances might be slim though. She'll be back to square one if he decides to change hospitals. Mao would probably foresee this and command him to do so. Saijo's house was searched. So it would be natural for the two to conclude that Yakuza was lurking near the hospital. Even so, Haru still insists on performing the stakeout alone. She has her reasons. The pill bags were not in the trash heap the day before yesterday. They were nowhere to be found when she had fallen into Mao's trap and determined that Saijo had fled to the Plaza Hotel. And with a whopping three of them in total, Haru <sighs> found it hard to believe that she had simply missed them. In other words, someone left them there after this first search. Oribe and his cronies believed that Saijo would never return to his room, so no men were spared to guard the apartment. Thus, if someone did indeed return, nobody would have known. But that someone was not Saijo. It was Mao. Haru's hypothesis ran like so. Unlike Saijo, Mao had never revealed himself. Why then would he hesitate to come face to face with men from the Yakuza? He could walk right by them. They'd never be the wiser. As for Mao's motive behind panting the medication bags in Saijo's trash, Haru bit into her lip again as the thought forced itself upon her mind. The taste of her previous defeat still lingered in her mouth. It was probably some attempt at sparking another game. It's so darn cold. Let's just hope I don't get into trouble for this, Haru thought. Should be okay. I'm over 18 after all. Megalipses. Ellipses. The Grand Prix of figure skating finals were slated to begin today. Figure skating fanatic Aizawa Ichi skipped school to watch the men's match, which starts on the first day. Hey, Sabaki, where's Susami? I don't think she's here today. Something the matter? Nah, she just left her cell phone at my apartment yesterday. Oh, really? Why don't you let me handle it? Sabaki only suggested that because she knew I was likely to miss Usami due to my skipping. Nah, it's no big deal. Usami, you strange girl. What's going on? Last night, you said you got a hold of the clue. Are you moving ahead on your own? Megalipses. Ellipses. Mao was right. Saijo sat alone in the back seat of a rental car. He pulled the newly bought curtain open just the slightest bit, carefully took a peek at the hospital outside the car window, and found the girl wandering about as expected. Her name was Usami Haru, a member of the Yakuza, and the girl who claimed to be Fujiwara Norika when they met on the docks. Mao described this girl with ghostly long hair as his greatest obstacle. He had warned Saijo about the outstanding insight hiding behind her dispirited appearance and actions, but Saijo found it hard to believe. She paced back and forth in the residential area with her arms wrapped around herself, probably trying to shield herself from the cold. Saijo ruminated on Mao's advice. Kill her if you get the chance. Usami will probably be the only one to notice the trap behind the medicine bags. Detectives know to watch the scene of the crime, but the Mafia would never discover the truth. 
They'll just start searching elsewhere after they conclude you won't be returning to the apartment. Mao was absolutely right. Saisho glanced around, and no signs of Yakuza were anywhere to be seen. When the time is right, engage her at your own discretion. Remember that Usami might be leading some thugs. Even if you find Usami alone, don't forget the possibility of others hiding nearby. Lastly, when you launch your attack, snatch Usami's phone away from her as a first priority. Separate her from her reinforcements. You would pull Usami into the car, then find a quiet spot to kill her. Mao would take care of the corpse. Okay, now where do I go from here? Megalipses. Ellipses.